After SpaceX's recent incident at Massey, many people assumed it would set the Starship program back significantly. But not only did SpaceX announce that the event wouldn't impact their target timeline, they've actually accelerated progress. So how are they doing that? It's been a while since Booster 18 suffered an anomaly during a gas system pressure test. In this kind of test, SpaceX loads gaseous oxygen, nitrogen, and sometimes helium into the booster to pressurize the main propellant tanks in the composite overwrapped pressure vessels, COPVs. The goal is to make sure the tanks, pressure systems, and valves all work properly before any super cold liquid propellants are added. During this test, something went wrong and a hole was blown into the side of the booster. Since then, people have been trying to figure out what happened. One explanation is that the booster may have lost too much internal pressure. Starship boosters rely on slight internal pressure to keep their thin steel walls rigid. If the pressure inside drops below the pressure of the outside air, the walls can collapse inward, similar to how an empty soda can crumples if the air is sucked out of it. There are two main ways that kind of pressure loss could occur. One is that the tank was filled with warm gas, which later cooled. As the gas cools, it contracts, lowering the pressure inside the tank. If the pressure falls far enough, the tank becomes weaker than the air pressing on it from the outside. The other possibility is that a valve was opened incorrectly, or a pump was run in a way that removed too much gas from the tank, creating a slight vacuum. In both situations, the booster would no longer have the outward pressure it needs to stay rigid, making a collapse possible. Right now, the leading theory is that the issue may involve one of the booster's COPVs. A COPV is basically a metal liner wrapped in strong composite fibers. The metal liner keeps the gas sealed inside, while the composite wrap provides strength and prevents the vessel from bursting. These tanks are lightweight, but can safely hold very high pressures, which is why they are used in many aerospace and industrial applications. On Super Heavy, COPVs store gases such as nitrogen for powering pneumatic valves and for spin-starting the Raptor engines. They also store oxygen and methane gas for the torch igniters that light the engines. People think a COPV failure is the most likely cause because all the evidence points toward the Chine area, where several of the booster's COPVs are installed. The COPVs in that section were found shattered. The hole in the side of the booster lines up exactly with the chine's location, and vapor was seen leaking from the chine moments before the main tank split open. Inside the booster, the transfer tube also shows a puncture that looks as if something struck it from the outside. The tearing pattern on the tank wall suggests the metal first bent inward, meaning pressure was lost, before the escaping gas forced it back outward. Together, these clues strongly suggest that something inside the chine, most likely a COPV, ruptured and punched a hole into the main liquid oxygen tank, damaging surrounding hardware as it failed. If the root cause is a COPV, the issue is theoretically fixable. COPVs can be removed, replaced, or requalified using inspection techniques such as embedded microphones that can detect tiny fiber cracks as they form. Sudden COPV bursts from overpressurization are usually prevented through careful material certification, conservative pressure limits, and rigorous proof pressure tests. It is also critical that the external gas supply used to pressurize them is controlled precisely to avoid accidental overpressurization. After the earlier Ship 36 COPV incident, SpaceX upgraded the COPVs on Starship, at least on the ship section. According to the company, COPVs on upcoming flights would operate at lower pressures and undergo extra inspections and proof tests before any reactive propellants are loaded. SpaceX also strengthened its acceptance standards and developed a new non-destructive testing method to find internal damage. In addition, new protective covers are being added around COPVs to provide shielding and make external damage easier to spot. What remains unclear is whether these upgrades were applied to Super Heavy boosters as well. Without that information, it's difficult to know whether Booster 18 was equipped with the newer protections or still relied on older COPV hardware. A blown-up COPV doesn't mean Starship is a bad design. Any rocket that uses this type of pressure vessel could suffer the same kind of failure if the conditions line up badly enough. That said, it may be time for SpaceX to consider producing its own COPVs in-house. Doing so would give the company much tighter control over quality and allow it to tailor the vessels specifically to Starship's design needs. 
They already manufacture COPVs for Falcon 9, so this wouldn't be unheard of. Of course, none of this changes the fact that a COPV failure is still just a leading theory. It hasn't been confirmed as the root cause, we only know it contributed heavily to the damage. Something else could be at the heart of the incident. There are several possibilities. A manufacturing defect might have slipped through inspection. The COPV or its tubing could have been damaged during transport or installation. An easy mistake, given how sensitive composite structures can be. Even though the carbon fiber wrap is incredibly strong, its strength depends on thousands of fibers sharing the load. If only a few are cut, kinked, or crushed, the whole vessel becomes weaker. The surrounding stainless steel isn't invincible either. Tubing could have failed under stress, welds could have cracked, or another part of the system could have given way before the COPV itself did. At this point, the true root cause still isn't known. What matters is that SpaceX is pushing the limits of a new booster design and gathering data with every test. Booster 18's failure will likely shape improvements in the next version of Super Heavy, just as earlier tests shape the vehicles flying today. With Ship 3 and the next booster iteration on the horizon, there's a lot of hope that these upgrades will bring Starship closer to the reliable, fully reusable system SpaceX is aiming for. Another question is whether any of the undamaged components can be reused. At present, the methane tank has been dismantled, and only the hot staging ring has been preserved, or possibly the entire section that includes the grid fin plugs. Beyond this, it appears that this may be the only component salvaged from the entire booster. For B-19, the necessary pieces are available, but verifying their flightworthiness and integrating them with other parts to make the full booster ready for flight is risky and would likely add significant time. This approach seems unlikely unless the B-19 components are currently very incomplete. The B-18 structure was completed ahead of schedule at the pad and ship, and as far as we know, it was not on the critical path. In contrast, B-19 is the critical path, which allows other work to be deprioritized to accelerate its build. With additional teams and resources, many processes could be shortened, transfer stands could be ready and waiting, and overall construction could be fast-tracked. The primary potential delay is determining exactly why B-18 failed, not just that a COPV failed, but identifying the precise process that led to the failure. Looking at previous boosters, the time from first sighting to completed stack has varied widely, ranging from about a month and a half to nearly six months. This suggests that reaching the same point with B-19 could take significantly less time. Completing it in just two months, as was done with B-17, seems unlikely, but with B-19 being the primary focus, it is not out of the question. It seems SpaceX may even be aiming to move faster than expected. The company announced that the team plans to have the next Super Heavy booster fully stacked by December, while Starship V-3's maiden flight is still on track for early next year. According to a post on X, Starship's 12th flight test remains targeted for the first quarter of 2026. SpaceX has a strong track record of following through on its announcements, and recent progress demonstrates why. Over the weekend, the fourth aft section of Booster 19 was rolled out to Starbase's Mega Bay and stacked, bringing the booster to 15 rings tall with only a few sections remaining. Completing four sections in just five days marks the fastest booster assembly to date. This pace is impressive and bodes very well for the Starship V3 program. And that's not all. SpaceX has just crossed a major milestone for the future of its Starship program. The Department of the Air Force has officially approved a plan allowing SpaceX to redevelop Space Launch Complex 37, SLC-37, for Starship and Super Heavy operations. SpaceX celebrated the decision on X, writing, We've received approval to develop Space Launch Complex 37 for Starship operations at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Construction has started. With three launch pads in Florida, Starship will be ready to support America's national security and Artemis goals as the world's premier spaceport continues to evolve toward airport-like operations. We'd like to thank the Department of the Air Force, 45th Space Force, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife for their efforts on the environmental review. The Air Force's record of decision, issued after a public comment period and a review of potential environmental impacts, authorizes up to 76 Starship and Super Heavy launches and 152 landings per year. The next step is for the Air Force, Space Force, and SpaceX to finalize a property agreement and additional accords tailored to national security objectives. According to the document, 
Starship operations at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station will ensure mission essential functions for the Department of War, enable the U.S. Space Force to meet current and future mission requirements, and support civilian launch capabilities needed for the rapid increase in launch demand. The approval outlines how SpaceX can rebuild the pad, move hardware, and eventually launch and land Starship and Super Heavy on the Space Coast. It covers everything from construction and processing facilities to road improvements. Phillips Parkway and Old A1A within the base will be widened to support the transport of Starship hardware between Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center. While the Air Force determined there was no practical alternative to redeveloping SLC-37, the project comes with extensive safeguards, especially environmental ones. Requirements include dust control, hurricane and flood resilience, noise reduction measures, wildlife protections, stormwater management, historic site monitoring, and habitat restoration plans. SpaceX must also mitigate permanent habitat loss and follow strict guidelines to protect species such as the southeastern beach mouse, Florida scrub jay, and gopher tortoise. Residents can expect traffic controls during construction and major launch campaigns, continued notifications for loud events and sonic booms, and a formal process to handle potential damage claims. The plan also details coordination with the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, Cape Canaveral National Seashore, and other nearby agencies to minimize disruptions. In June, controlled demolitions at SLC-37 brought down United Launch Alliance's former mobile service tower and lightning protection structures, clearing the way for future Starship infrastructure. The site previously supported Delta IV missions. With the decision signed on November 20, 2025, SpaceX is now cleared to bring Starship to the Eastern Range alongside Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, another major expansion of activity on the Space Coast. The final lease agreement, new pad construction, and Starship's remaining development work still lie ahead, so launches from SLC-37 won't happen immediately, but they won't be far off either.